So the question at hand is how do we move beyond a pandemic? And ladies and gentlemen, according to an article published in the World Economic Forum, the COVID-19 pandemic is not only a global health crisis, but it is also a catalyst for reimagining the way we want to live going forward. We are a nation in decline, and hence this bold, some say foolhardy move to table the idea of a better Malaysia Assembly. What was amazing is that when we travelled, when we operated in different countries, the most effective professionals were the Malaysians. Because Malaysians actually engage across communities, across cultures, much easier than others. We're looking at uh, you know, the Better Malaysia Assembly, would you consider looking at a political career as an option to drive this agenda? No, 110% uh, no. Uh, because, you know, somebody said, oh, you must walk the talk. Uh, you must go into politics. I said, if I go into politics, I cannot talk. Structural reforms involve uh, state institutions. These state institutions need a complete reform from the ground up. We need to have innovation. This is critical for Malaysia. We need to have political stability. That's also critical for Malaysia. Just two weeks ago, I went to a coffee shop, wanted to have coffee. They didn't accept cash. They didn't accept credit card. They only accepted an e-wallet. And I was like, wow, how far we have come. But what e-wallets do, and you know, credit to the government for doing this by making sure that everybody got like uh, the 30 ringgit in the wallet, every single budget for the last couple of years they're doing this, is that people are now using these services. And I think, again, this goes back to the issue of trust. If you trust that who you've hired are great, capable people and that they are adults and they know how to manage themselves, then creating the enabling conditions and giving them the flexibility to choose from among your toolbox and understanding what those needs could be for different people will work.
Good afternoon and welcome to uh, MIM Crucial Conversations. Today is a very special day and as we celebrate the International Women's Day, let's express our sincere appreciation to all the strong, intelligent and the simply amazing women in our lives, both personally and professionally. In fact, we should be celebrating every day. Now, our topic for today's crucial conversation is on gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow, which incidentally is this year's theme for International Women's Day. And we look at the shifting mindsets, behaviors, and practices for enduring change. Please allow me to thank our sponsor, the Conrad Adian Stiftung, our supporting partners, the Federation of Public District Companies, Bahad, the Malaysian Insurance Institute, United Nations Global Compact Network, Malaysia and Brunei, and our media partner, Daily Express, for their continuous support. I would also like to thank our distinguished panel of speakers. First, YB Nurul Iza Anwar, Ms. Lee Su Fen, and Dr. Shanti Sambaya for coming on board to share your knowledge and experts' insights with our participants. We are not only live here on Zoom, but we are also live on MIM's official Facebook. So please feel free to inform your friends and colleagues to join us and leave your comments so that we could read them during the session. Now, embracing diversity is creating an inclusivity at the workplace that enables employees to celebrate each other's differences in culture, habits, lifestyles, and opinions. The clock has begun ticking for companies to start advocating equity, equality and ensuring that diversity, equity and inclusion, in short, you call it as DE&I, has become an organizational priority. We must also remember that uh, gender equal, equity is one of the 17 sustainable development goals adopted by the United Nations in 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, ensure that by 2030, all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Well, in this webinar, we will dive deep into three subtopics of today's theme that has direct and indirect repercussions to leaders, CEOs, SME owners, and professionals. Our first speaker for today is none other than YB Nurul Iza Anwar. Now allow me to introduce her. YB Nurul Iza Anwai is the current member of parliament for Permatang Pau, serving a third term in the Malaysian legislature. Her political career began with the creation of the People's Justice Party in Shortka Adilan in 1999, where she played a vital role in its establishment. To this day, she remains a member of Adilan after serving the political party thrice elected vice president from 2010 to 2018. She's also a founding member of the previous Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement Caucus and member of the Women's Caucus and is on the committee of the Inter-Parliamentary Union Malaysia. Currently, she serves on the Public Accounts Committee and is Kaadilan spokesman spokesperson for the Ministry of Women, Family and Community. She is also an active member of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for reform and for all places of detention, where she continues to reiterate a call for national prison reform. However, due to her commitments in parliament today, Waibin Nurul is unable to do this session live, but I must thank her because last week she took the time off from her busy schedule to come over to MIM, and we managed to do a pre-recording of this session with her, and especially on the topic of women as policy makers making a difference. Now I'll invite you to listen to this pre-recorded session. YB, good afternoon and thank you for being with us and we are indeed honored to have you at the Malaysian Institute of Management and in conjunction with the International Women's Day, um, we are indeed honored again to have you here. And our topic for today is about um, you know, gender equity for a sustainable future. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, salam hormat, and I think, um, thank you very much for the opportunity in giving my thoughts. Um, when you talk about making gender equality today 
for a sustainable tomorrow, I think one of the key aspects at um, shifting mindsets is to mainstream the Ministry of Women. Yeah, the federal government uh, must reorient its focus on protecting and preserving the dignity and well-being of women, children, the elderly, the differently abled, the destitute, victims of domestic violence and abuse and disaster victims, flood uh, this most recently, through the re-establishment of the ministry as a frontline ministry. You consider that the ministry must devise ways to protect female-headed households, children susceptible to predatory um, elements, and aging Malaysian population. All these vulnerable pockets of society can be further empowered if you empower the ministry. But if you treat it like second fiddle, you won't shift mindset. So for me, the top-down approach, which is quite powerful and prevalent in Malaysia, um, while we wait for the, the support, has to be led by, by the government. And it's a great opportunity, especially following a pandemic. So hopefully with uh, pressure, support from everybody, you know, prioritizing women's issues, we can get to do what we need to do as soon as possible. YB, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us, uh, you know, on uh, women and uh, equality. Right. Thanks for having me. All yeah. right. So I would like to ask you some questions and then uh, to set the stage, uh, let's look back at uh, some background of uh, women's involvement as policymakers in Malaysia. And in our first parliament yeah. of the Federation of Malaya in 1959, we had three female representatives which was about 3% of the total MPs. Fast forward today, we are in the 14th term and we have 33 MPs as at uh, now, which is about 15% of the total MPs. Yeah. Singapore has about 29% representation of women in parliament and Indonesia has another 20% representation of women in parliament. Why we, uh, you have certain, you know, we have certainly moved Right, but uh, the first women minister in Malaysia was the late one Fatima Hashim, who was appointed 53 years ago. Since then, there have not been more than three fully appointed ministers under one administration until the Pakatan Harapan administration in 2018, which had five women as ministers. Yeah. And the government today have uh, four female ministers. Since the first cabinet, we had only had about 18 female ministers and uh, Datin Sri Wan Azizha, your mother, you know, was our first female deputy prime minister and holds record for helming the highest position in cabinet as a female to date. YB, as I mentioned, we have certainly progressed, but probably not at the desired rate that we had hoped for. What are your thoughts on this? Thank you, uh, Siva, for the question. I think it's very important for us to look at the historic perspective of how many women have actually made it into the August House, not to mention the top mm. position in government. Mm. And yes, um, I think the first legislator was Tan Sri Dr. Devaki Krishnan. Um, and, and today, of course, we have more, but as you rightly pointed out, it's not nearly enough. Uh, we, we have to do better, not just in terms of the numbers, because the numbers mm. are supposed to describe the ability for us to influence policies. Yeah, uh, but I think also more importantly is the quality. So even as you have leaders helming certain ministries, mm. female leaders, um, they have to be given and be able to expand, fully expand their respective roles. So I always talk about even mainstreaming mm -hmm, the issues mm -hmm. of women empowerment, mm -hmm. mainstreaming the issues of, or, or the policies to make sure Malaysia is more safe for children everywhere. So this is incumbent immediately mm. before we push very hard the increase of female legislators on both male and female leaders, you know, whether it is the Ministry of Home Affairs. Defense. People talk about home affairs or defence and automatically they think, that's important. That's a senior ministry. But I believe the most senior yeah. ministry is, you know, Ministry of Women, yeah. Ministry of Health, Absolutely. Um, you know, Ministry of Education. <laughs> the pandemic has exposed uh, these ministries to be the most important uh, in affecting people's lives. Mm -hmm. 
But in your view, do you consider it as a slow progress? And uh, is it because we do not have enough women uh, capable leaders? Or is it because of the Petraki overruled gender equality in Malaysia? I believe that uh, certainly we have to do much more mm. because you see the numbers represented in the civil service, um, and a lot more women. But at the end of the day, if you look at the demographic, we're talking about 48.9%. Yes. Yeah. Those are women. And clearly, it has to be represented in terms of the enabling ecosystem. How easy it is for women to get childcare support. How easy it is for women to be uh, paid equally mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in comparison to men. So yes, we have a long way to go first. I believe it's not necessarily um, uh, unique to Malaysia. Many countries face the challenge of patriarchy. Mm, um, yes, you know, so many countries. You just have to look at Negeri Milan, the state of Negeri Milan, where women and matriarchy <laughs> is quite <laughs> accepted. Okay. So at the end of the day, it's about political will and what we decide to do with our respective families, the relationship dynamic with our siblings, with the men, um, you know, among us, and the men themselves, what they can do to uh, affect change. And I believe the crucial importance is to make sure there's early intervention mm. in schools, in communities, in religious uh, you know, authorities and, and ecosystems. And this permeates throughout the different religions and practices. But it really requires reminders, you know, support, and of course, uh, events such as this mm. to mainstream uh, gender equality and, of course, uh, the agenda to uh, empower women and provide safety for children. That was a good observation uh, when you spoke about Negri Sumilan, you know, matriarchy. I mean, the reformasi <laughs> made me go everywhere, every state. <laughs> so, you know, been there, done that. Alhamdulillah, it's, it's a great blessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I've learned right. a lot. But yeah, this is how I, I see it. All mm. the strong women. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's yes, just yes, there. Yes. You decide to say, yes, I want to embrace it or, or repel it. Mm. Yeah, you would be also, uh, you know, it is an interesting thing that uh, even back in MIM, yeah. it is, uh, they always say that, you know, we have women power, you know, we've got more women <laughs> than uh, men. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, going, going back to parliament again, you know, uh, it is important to have more, do you think it is important to have more women representation in parliament and in the government? Uh, because research has shown that women have great leadership qualities and have been successful in institutional reforms. What are your views on this? Um, you know, as you rightly pointed out, uh, Siva, it's there, it's validated, mm. it's evidence-based. Um, you do uh, have the crucial importance of how women will change the, the, the landscape, how they can contribute. But I always believe it's a symbiotic relationship. Everyone in life, uh, there's a term called karamah insaniya, mm. the dignity of men and women. So you're according people dignity. So even as, as you know, uh, positions have been given to women, but the, the, main, um, the main background, the foundational basis is to make sure that you're according dignity, uh, dignified positioning of women so that they can help uh, unearth policies that are fairer to everybody, uh, you know, the 48.9% mm -hmm. of, of, um, of people in this country. And having said that, men also have to be accorded uh, a dignified position. So for me, it means uh, sometimes it's also looking at um, how it falls um, you know, in society, how it, it takes place, whether if you have female legislators, is the environment helping her to do her work? Helping her to thrive. To thrive. Mm -hmm. um, is she facing either backlash? So these things have to be taken into consideration. You need to also cajole, convince and get the men to be part of the process. And I believe, you know, sometimes they always say bully, uh, mm. you know, bullies end up bullying others, right? Uh, hurt people hurt. Right. So I think it is important to take into account the background, the social economic background of respective segments. In England, the intervention um, takes place in juvenile in institutions, ju juvenile detention centers, because, you know, once you were a, a victim, victim, you continue the cycle. So for me, you need to have a healthy dose of empathy. Mm. Um, of course, certain boundary setting, certain clear-cut um, kind of uh, 
uh, unflinching resolve to change things, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, a healthy dose of empathy. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I think empathy is very important, right? And uh, like what you have rightly mentioned, you know, yeah. you, you need to have that uh, environment, the right environment, so that, uh, you know, women in leadership positions also thrive. And uh, that environment is, of course, created, uh, co-created together as a team. And uh, men play a major role in making sure Absolutely. that uh, women are Absolutely. successful, you know. And uh, YB, you've been a member of parliament since 2008. Oh my God. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and which means that you've been an MP for 14 years. Congratulations. And then you've been successful in all the three I'm general glad. elections. People you've contested. have been kind enough to vote <laughs> in favor of me, yeah. I'm sure. Um, what do you think people see in you and uh, that they keep electing you as a representative? You know, one of the greatest um, uh, uh, opportunities in, in my life is the opportunity to serve. And uh, this vocation, when I first joined, uh, I uh, felt it was one of the heaviest burdens I've had to carry because mm. you're talking about Amana, right? Uh, this kind of the right yeah it, it's a res huge responsibility you're representing uh, your constituents they are an extension of your your family unit because you also want to make sure you're able to address their needs and you understand the key problems affecting society whether it's socioeconomic inequality whether it's introducing the right policies to protect the most vulnerable but whether it's also to ensure the most innovative the most talented amongst you do get their mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. under the sun and these things, you know, require a lot of thinking and a lot of hard work. I, I, when I started out, um, I, I, you know, just fresh off of being a, a mother mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, n zero allocation. So you really, I really felt that was a good training for me because I utilized my um, allowance as member of parliament. So you're serving the people, right? Serving the right yard and understanding the importance of planning. Um, so... For me, the greatest honor is to be able to serve then for a second term. You, you, you're not gonna, you're nothing, nothing without the votes of the people, people, right? Because we're a democracy and that's why we want to perfect the system. So by the time I got to my third term in Permatang Pau, uh, it's just been you know, a very steep learning curve, but a great honor. Sure, yeah. And I think it's important for us to always not just be quick thinking on our feet, but understand the implications of everything, that the decisions that you make. So we're not even ministerial level yet, but your words carry weight. Your actions, uh, the programs you introduce. So it can't just be, you know, melepaskan batuk di tangga. It has mm. to be evidence-based. And that's why um, I was also lucky to work alongside experts, uh, economists, um, uh, doctors, medical uh, experts, in order to craft uh, the best policies, uh, including psychologists, yeah? Uh, and of course, it's always going to be trial and error. That's why I believe in pilots. No one is perfect. Yep. I think it's important for us to remember that, and a, a healthy dose of humility yes. to, to see how you can further improvise. So, um, actually, I've been, you know, I've been very fortunate to be really? one of the two to two. There's only 222 MPs. I know we have a lot in Malaysia, but it's... Um, you know, it's, it's a really, when I first joined, it was a really great honour. And I hope that we work hard to uh -huh, maintain uh -huh. the integrity. And that's why I was very touched by the words of the Ukrainian Premier today. Because I think, you know, the, the best judge of your character is when you're faced with such adversity. Uh, adversity but yet you, you continue to uh, hold your hold position with much and... dignity. Mm. Yeah. And I like the way, you know, you mentioned about humility, you know, I think it is in you. It comes from your mom and the family yeah. and uh, the serving, you know, you, you were thrown into uh, this whole thing when you were as early as 17 years yeah. old, right? Yeah. And you started your career and there's a lot of things that uh, you have learned and you continue learning that and you just but that's mentioned life, that right? Life is that. always about learning, um, learning how to become a good mother, a good parent, mm -hmm. a good human being. Um, T.S. Eliot was the one who said the greatest wisdom one could hope to acquire is wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom and wisdom. So, sorry, humility. Humility. <laughs> humility is endless. It's yeah, endless. Yeah. Yeah, the, humility, greatest, the greatest wisdom one could hope to acquire so is humility. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, why we let's move on to the sure. next question is, you uh, know, in your constituency of uh, Parmatang Pao, you yes. know, uh, it's actually quite, quite close to where I live also. Yes. <laughs> okay. You have, Arambata, okay. you have yeah. carried out many programs for the needy, uh, like the Rose yeah. program, you know, the Parmatang Pao Women uh, yeah. project, and you have the multidimensional poverty study, and uh, then also the Talian Prihatin, to name a few. I must say congratulations, you know, uh, on all the work that you have done and uh, the impact that it has done to the people in your constituency. Uh, what is, in your view, that needs to be done more now with the COVID-19, that uh, it, probably the challenges are different now? And uh, what really drives or inspires you to carry out discontinued activities? So first, we have to understand uh, that it's not nearly enough all the ongoing programs, you know, because at the end of the mm. day, we do need a seamless integration across agencies and it does require um, the role of the government, whether state or federal, mm. because systemically, even when you talk about safety nets, you look at what's happening to the vulnerable, the bottom 40 of households, now added on uh, a million more yeah, after COVID, it's about how can they make ends meet when they are being pressured so badly uh, due to the pandemic. They have lost jobs, much worse compared yeah. to those in the T20 because of course you're more assured, right? Mm. Even when there's extreme climate changes, uh, those on the higher income will be able to live in areas that are far more secure, um, far higher in plains compared to those from the lower income. So these things make it far more onerous on those from the low income. So the, the whole spectrum and specter of the, the, um, the pandemic should remind us that we need to change the existing systemic flaws, whether we reinvest and further support healthcare. And, and that's why for me, uh, when I look at the impact of the, um, you know, of uh, the possibility of ending a generational ban on those who are born after 2005, smoking. I understand the rationale mm. because the B40 kids are the ones who are going to be the major, major victim of this. So for me, in terms of the programs, you know, we have to keep on going. You're, start, you're, you're always running mm. to keep up because the problems are not going to be reduced. We, we have uh, had to postpone our methadone ban, um, you know, collaboration with, with the mosque. But we're going to restart it again because, you know, uh, drug addiction have increased. Um, you're talking about domestic violence. Mm. So that's why how we provide support has to be multidimensional. Money, yes, okay. But at the end of the day, how people are faring psychologically, how people are faring emotionally, and the ability of their children to grasp and absorb intellectual content. Because online schooling have disrupted an entire generation. Yeah. Almost about two years, really. Right? And then uh, probably, uh, you know, for one whole generation. Yes, uh, for sure. So mm -hmm. how do you utilize TVET? How do you utilize like short courses so that the kids who have, lo I mean, a lot of them don't want to go to school anymore. Yes. Uh, they perhaps, you know, stayed back, lived with their grandparents mm -hmm. or just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with their friends. So there has to be deep rethinking. There's an IDB paper. Um, there's many comparisons looking at the, the region. But, uh, you know, it's also an interesting time because we have this chance. It's just that we have to enact the political will mm. to do things differently. Please don't go back don't to back status quo. Boring lah. Boring lah. You know, I mean, let's not go back to status quo. We, we've seen the worst. Yes. Let's change the way things are being done for the better. Incidentally, you were talking about TVAC and then the next question is on TVAC. Sure. You know, according to the Ministry Incidentally. of... Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> according to the Ministry of Higher Education, yes. you know, Malaysia produced about 255,000 graduates in 2020. You know, approximately 85% of mm. them were from academic track yeah. and 14% from the TVAC program. Uh, this is very much far from the aspirational target shared in the 11th Malaysia plan of about 35% of yes. TVET yeah. uh, grads, you know, yes. uh, even though there have been many measures taken in the 12th Malaysia plan to strengthen the TVET through improvements mm. of ecosystem, etc., upgrading its quality recognition. Um, given that you have championed this uh, during your Pakatan administration, what are your thoughts 
on the influences <coughs> impending the take up rate for TVET programs? So we have uh, been fortunate because the Auditor General has exposed the weaknesses in our TVET programs. Mm -hmm. It's very fragmented in Malaysia. You have what more than seven, eight ministries in charge of TVET. Mm -hmm. So the Ministry of Higher Education has now been tasked as the Secretariat of the Majlis TVET. Yeah, mm -hmm. but are they addressing the issue of the central uh, centra centrality of powers? and authority and a single accreditation body that kind of governs everything else. So until and unless you address that, it's very difficult to kind of fight against the bureaucracy, right? Because uh, already during the pandemic, it's one thing, you can have academic programs run online, but TVET institutions is very hands-on. So if you see the UN EVOC, um, hmm assessment, um, one of the key um, losers in the pandemic are the TVET generation. generation. So for me, this is a huge wake up call. I mean, it's like a clarion call of sorts, because first you have the Auditor General, uh, you know, unearthing the key weaknesses. Second, the numbers itself showcase a huge disparity in terms of what you're targeting. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough having a majlis. You need to um, address the power dynamic. Okay. I, um, I prepared a, a bill uh, together with a lot of volunteers uh, when I was head of the TVET Empowerment Committee. It's, it's called, you know, the, um, to centralize uh, industry as well as the TVET program under a uh, commission because I think you, you can't rely on an accreditation body placed under the Ministry of Human Resource to kind of order other TVET institutions that's under different ministries. The, the power, power. Mm. Uh, is uneven. So I, I gave a copy to uh, both Minister Dr. Saravanan as well as mm -hmm. Dr. Noraini because mm. for me, governments can change, but policies, policies. that are sound mm. must continue. So I, you know, I hope that they look into this because I believe at the end of the day, you need uh, to have some clause, uh, clause like, you know, sedikit <laughs> tajam, to make sure that you can um, address this because a lot of the government-led TV institutions are also, also needing improvement. improvement. So when you have built some degree of, of integrity, mm -hmm. uh, that there's you know, no one will be let, no one will be given second chances lah. You know, uh, we follow through one simple rule of law, then the quality will improve. But the children need help. They need to shorten Absolutely, the courses yes. because the, the courses are very much longer. Mm. And at the end of the day, I feel that all this running against uh, making sure there's more um, uh, academically oriented students. Remember, that's not the surefire determination of success. You know, we have to celebrate our, our kids, especially from the, the technical sector. There's nothing wrong, uh, you know, with, with knowing what to do and, and harnessing that skill. I come from the, an academic background. Mm. And I tell you, when the aeroplane is not working, you're not going to look for any engineers. Engineer what can you do? You know, yeah. if the toilet's not working, you're going to find a, uh, someone who's suitably addressing that prob problem. So, you know. You need to have the living skills. Uh, for sure, yeah. for sure. And we need to reward those with sufficient living skills so that they feel there's, again, dignity, mm. honor mm. in what they do. Mm. And then, of course, you can go up higher um, in, the, in the educational ranks because in Germany, uh, they go up to level six. So things need to change, but not, in, not, not enable the jump uh, towards the academic pathway because mm. that's not mm. accurate at all. It should be the TVET uh, continuum and pathway. Thank you very much. And, uh, now we talk about uh, you know gender equality. Yes. You know, gender equality historically has been uh, predominantly also in a women's movement, right? But the impact on gender inequality and how it is affecting women hasn't been really addressed. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so for me, it can't be restricted to a certain class. Hmm. Uh, yes, we do want women to be more powerful. But by the same token, we also need to address and assist women across the social strata, across the socioeconomic spectrum. So, you know, simple things like I, I feel, you know, uh, women who are working in the informal sector, they are far worse off after the pandemic. So they might not be in the top suites, you know, mm -hmm. they, they're not the, the, the higher rank, ranking, right, higher uh, earning. And, and they are the ones who are sometimes missed out on. 
So how do we ensure, uh, I know that uh, Perkeso and Sokso are working hard to make sure the, the women in the reformer sector are being protected through some schemes or, or, or the other. But um, I believe uh, we're, we're just not going far enough because one of the key things is to also energize the Ministry of Women, mm. um, not to be seen as being second fiddle, but really to push forward this agenda. It. Yeah, and this includes the women uh, by virtue of the lottery of birth are stateless. You know, we, we can't just be thinking women who have agency or who have um, uh, the right papers. Mm. You know, I, I could be stuck in another nation being invaded by Russia, right? Mm. So at the end of the day, it is really your lottery of birth that you are born um, at a certain time where you're able to maximize your potential. And that's why we need to ensure that we address inequality across the different mm. uh, segments. I think the, the focus on top 30% is good, well and good, but it's more than that, right? It, it has to be far more thorough and far more top-down. Uh, I, I like your phrase, you know, lottery of birth. That's life. <laughs> okay. I don't, don't believe in gambling, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like a, a lottery system. Yes, 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 yeah, yes, and that's why we need you, a lot you, of empathy. You, you don't get to choose, right? You don't. Yeah. And, Okay, some people feel that they're on the top 20. But I think during this pandemic, everyone has felt, has suffered a form of loss or yes, another. Yes. You might have lost someone you loved or you Absolutely. lost your uh, income levels. So, and you got lucky, right? Because you survived COVID and you managed mm -hmm. to get access mm -hmm. to hospital. But what if you were in Sarawak, you know, in some area where it's very far to get assistance? So things like this, um, I believe should pull us together. And instead of looking to the other communities as taking something mm, in a very, mm, mm. Um, um, how do I say, transactional world, we should really be thinking mm. how we can solve, solve these problems together. It's not easy. I know that a lot of money is going to be spent in it, but I think um, we, just, we just have to be a little bit more uh, supportive of one another, another. And we also have to be... Uh you know, we, we need to count our blessings. I think this is what yes, uh, you know, yes. the whole pandemic has taught us. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Uh, many of us are very fortunate, uh, you know, that uh, we still have our loved ones around. Yes. And there are many who did not even have the opportunity to see, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, when their loved ones were, you know, yes. laid to rest. Right. And Why the frontliners. Uh, and the frontliners, yes. We no, can't continue forget. to Continued, uh, hold the fort. Yeah. Hold the fort. Right, and uh, maybe you had said in an interview a few years ago that uh, one of the things oh my that you, I'm the I'm the, you know, just to recap, you know, one yeah. one of those things that you could that would give you so much joy as a politician is the fact that you can empower young women to be part of it. You know, do you feel the same now? And what do you think of the younger generation of women leaders that are coming up? I still consider you to be young, <laughs> and you are. <laughs> Not so young anymore. But I think everyone, you know, that is why I always see ourselves as a wadah, right, a vessel. Like we, we are here on earth um, in a very finite amount of time. Mm -hmm. So we do what we can for our generation. But it comes to naught if you're not able to empower others to do the same. And this includes young women and men. And I think the, 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 the other bit is also having a very clear-cut moral compass. Because whether you're young or old, there will be a time where you're going to be mm, tested. tested. And that moral compass can suddenly lose its direction. And my biggest fear is like, please, you know, keep me true um, to the values that I held when I was younger. And of course, improve on my knowledge and, and um, wisdom but never lose sight of that moral compass. So I try my best and I've been very fortunate because there's so many young interns who are still keeping in touch with me, who are still supporting the work and doing great work in the, their, their respective fields. But important uh, to mm -hmm. have that moral compass, you know, because I remember the former leader um, of the Democratic Alliance, um, he, he spoke to me <clears throat> from South Africa uh, and he said, you know, we can lose many things in our lives. Uh, we can lose money, we can lose our jobs, we can lose mm -hmm. being elected. Mm -hmm. But you just, 
you just can't lose, can your, lose integrity. your integrity and your yeah. values. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That, I mean, because it's, you know, that's why I can leave behind to my children. And uh, so we try our best to preserve it. And we try, you know, uh, seek support. And we try to ensure that when the time comes, we are able to empower and pass the baton to the younger one and not mm. be afflicted mm. with mm. some mm. dangers that the boomers are <laughs> inflicting. <laughs> Sorry, but yes, everyone's facing challenges, challenges. from the boomers. Right, yeah. right. I think we have a, uh, quite a build up now so that yeah. uh, I'm going to ask you these questions, you know, why be <laughs> one word that describes you as a leader? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't know. I hope uh, maybe empathetic or I'm sure. yeah, someone you can relate to, I hope. Mm. Yeah. Empathetic and uh, vulnerable. Well, well, vulnerable. You need to have boundaries. So I think sometimes you can be, but you have to also be able to protect yourself because you don't want to be vulnerable to the point that you you render others vulnerable who are under your care. Why me being a young uh, political leader? Yeah. You are also a mother to two teenagers. Yeah. Right. Tell us about your experience in balancing <laughs> work and motherhood. Oh my goodness, it was a lot easier when they were younger, or maybe, I don't know, because um, uh, I think mm. I try my best to be present. So sometimes the time is not much, but you have to be present. Whether you're doing your work, you're fully present, and it's very difficult when you have 1,001 things to do at once. <laughs> but I think being present with them, trying to learn that they are going mm. to be young adults with their own characteristics, temperament and personalities that's the hardest part right letting go as a mom and and sometimes you have to be a leader sometimes you have to be their best friend, best friend. but sometimes you also have to be a, a disciplinarian of sorts so that there's different characteristics um, that are embedded within a parent figure it is it's, it's, it's tough i mean i i think uh, i i um enjoyed and i utilize a lot of psychology mm learning from many others and a lot of patience oh my god and we learn through the mistakes also you know, yeah style of and error. no one's gonna get it right the first time if I'm everyone's sure, gonna tell I'm you sure. i was born a great parent please yeah there are no sop there's no sop no there's no sops at all and they're so surprising okay, yeah good so would you encourage uh, your children to follow your path you know politics and serve the yeah. community no no uh but I think I would encourage them to follow their own respective paths. Mm. Like I feel that they should feel confident in their decision making. And if politics is their chosen vocation, I would say, okay, you have to prepare yourself because it's like entering the Olympics, right? You have to make sure you're psychologically empowered. You are, you know, um, understanding the risks and uh, a lot of restrictions as well because you want to protect your, and preserve your integrity. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yeah, follow your, I will try to, my best to support them. Of course, I'll always be their mom and worry yeah, and I'm fret. Sure. Um, but it's important for them to have that kind of confidence to decide their own path forward. And I did ask him, why don't you want to be a doctor? Uh, I know we need a doctor to take care of everybody. <laughs> and he's like, it's too, okay, blood is gory. I said, okay, fine, I'm not going to be that one of those mothers forcing um, the children to be a doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But probably it is not in their cup of tea these days. Well, you know? my mom was a great ophthalmologist. So she, you know, she's been that kind of um, strength for everybody. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you can't force the children. I don't, my father and my mom didn't force me. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to maintain that tradition. Right. Yeah, Empower, right. but not. Empower uh, them, right. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as most of our viewers today, they yeah. are mostly uh, working mothers. What advice can you give them in terms of uh, women today pursuing and pursuing to become successful in their careers and also balancing their role of being mothers to children? So if they are a working mother, they don't need my advice. We just need to come together, laugh and cry together. <laughs> That's all because they know what to do. They know what it takes. Okay. I mean, really, it's like... I was talking to my sister, she, she has three kids now, she doesn't have a helper. Mm. So, I mean, like I said, she has a lot to teach me. So sometimes, yeah, we're just going to, let's have a crying and laughing session. Mm. We don't need to. It's good, but right? I think mm. it's also maybe self-love. Mm. You know, sometimes it's okay. You know, you can't, there's no such thing as, you know, having the ability to, to get it right. You can't have it all. I mean, it's okay not to have it all. 
You okay. know, I think going back to your issue of counting your blessings, it's okay not to have it all. You know, I, I feel sometimes certain marriages don't don't end up well, or you know, you're having you're struggling to get things to keep things together, and it's okay. You know, it. I think it's a reminder to yourself that, you know, you are loved no matter what, no matter in what position you you are. I've you know, I met many single moms, um, who are you know whether they they get into an accident and they say I can't really take care or do physio because I have to take care of my kids. So we, you know, we just need to be there for one another, you know, support each other um, and a community that supports. That's how many other countries overcome natural disasters because they feel that I have support from my neighbours, I have support from my community. That knowledge in itself mm. powers um, uh, the ability for you to recover from a natural calamity. And also, I think you'll agree with me that you need to love yourself too. Uh, absolutely. You, know, you, you have to... Uh, God created you, can you imagine? Like we, like the creation of man, right? I feel like it's such a, um, a miracle in itself. So yeah, you have to love yourself. You have to love, you have to love you, yeah. Mm. And remember that you are loved no matter what. And I think this pandemic has also helped us enjoy um, solitude. Yes. You know, uh, appreciate, appreciating the thoughts in your head and not running wild mm, with them, mm, but mm, just mm. regulating and appreciating who you are, getting to know who you are. Yeah. And many at times, you know, we always, uh, you know, when we are in solitude, like what you mentioned, yeah. you know, and we think that we need to keep on doing things, then only uh, we'll be moving ahead. But sometimes you just need to take that little break and then just sit down and, yeah. you know, have that silent moment. That itself is yeah. about uh, loving yourself and giving time to... That's how we came up with the multidimensional poverty index in mm. the time of COVID to, to run it and um, develop a COVID adjusted poverty line. In a, during a pandemic, it was under MCO and I was discussing with Professor Fatima Kari and Jannah. And I think, yeah, it's true, you know, it was a point of, to reflect, to refine certain ideas um, and to perfect it better. And of course, you won't get it 100% right. Mm. right? That, mm. That's life. But mm. you, it can help you shape into a more powerful outcome, inshallah. So if I recall our conversation, you know, when you need to cry, you need to cry. You need to. Right? <laughs> well, when when you want to laugh, you laugh. Right? And, uh, We're human. Yeah, we are human. Yeah. You, know? you need to love yourself and yeah. you need to have that uh, solitude. Right? I that mean, moment. I do appreciate stoicism. Mm. I do appreciate and I do believe that it's important for us to be calm no matter what happens. But it's also important to recognize your humanity that you know you are also in need of different levels of you know ex you know just experiences well let me tell you that the women are really stoic <laughs> have to be <laughs> it's up to them you know i i, I have yeah. in my own personal experience i've seen women are really stoic I, we have to give it to them in your interview <laughs> in 2019 okay mm -hmm. trying to re uh, recall is that you had mentioned that uh, that would be your final term as uh, mp has this changed now and uh, will we see you contesting in G15? And I think with the energy that you have, you have more to offer. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I think the pandemic helped me uh, see mm. things in a different light. I would uh, very much like to contribute still. And Please. Of course, mm. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Too bad you're not voting for Madame Pao. But, you know, I, I don't know where the party would decide to field me. But, you know, I would like to continue. Mm. So, because mm. sometimes, as a legislator, you have that voice and you, you do want to pursue. And it's not easy because the degree of toxicity, um, it hurts, you know. But uh, by the same token, I guess that's life overall. Um, I, I see what's happening elsewhere. And uh, we do have um, a lot to fight for, a lot to, you know, thrive and, and enjoy uh, still. So we do need to fight for these freedoms and for a democratic enabling Malaysia, uh, multiracial, you know, celebrating our uh, diversity. And it comes at a price, meaning you have to continue to fight for these values. If not, then other values would then precede you and, and overtake. Mm -hmm. And that, that mm -hmm. I can't leave that to happen uh, to my children, at least to the best of my ability. Thank you so much. At least we know you will be there. <laughs> we'll you know, see what the leadership says, say, you know. <laughs> they might say, we don't want you anymore. So. <laughs> no, no, you will be there. And, uh, you know, 
I would like it, to congratulate you in it, advance. Okay. It's going to be a tough election. Yeah, I'll really, tell you that. Yeah. It's going to be a tough year. Mm. Nobody is secure. So, yeah. But uh, end of the day, you know, we have to believe in the universe and, uh, you know, we, the right, uh, you know, we will have the right people to represent us. I think the country needs yeah. a lot of things. I mean, I think, you know, Martin Luther King said, like, the arc of, of history bends towards uh, justice, right? It, it's long. But it bends towards justice. It's a long so, haul. Yeah, and it, it's always a, every generation would have its struggle. So we we have to really take a, kind of a, a chill pill mm. and do our best. And, and, you know, that's what's important, not give up. Okay, I think probably you're almost coming to the end. Yes. But let me ask you this, you yes. know. Uh, one word that comes to your mind when you hear these great names, you know, Angela Merkel, yeah. you know, the former Chancellor of uh, Germany, and Stella. just Stella, okay? yeah, yeah. Jacinda Ardern, yeah. right? And also our local, uh, you know, we have got leaders like uh, Dr. Nicole, David, etc. You know, etc. What is that one word when it comes to your mind? I mean, you know, you know um, they're deeply inspirational. They're, it's um, it really touches your heart on the the um, the fact that women can soar higher, and that's why you have to provide opportunities for more women for educational opportunities, for them to be protected from any harm, for them to live, to grow up, to work in safe, uh, in safe you know, environments, and for them not to be victimized in any way. And of course, this applies to boys as well, right? Because mm -hmm. when you raise young boys, young teenagers, you are able to also inculcate these values. So I just love uh, to see these women, and I love that... Um, you know, it's important to always um, make sure these values are accessible. Yeah, because that's what you want to impart it to others. And uh, why we, can you name us a woman or a woman leader whom you admire most and what are your reasons for it? I think the, you, the, 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 the ones that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, for example, uh, the Chancellor, her career, I mean, it's it's really stellar. stellar. The, the things mm -hmm. people used to say about her, you know, the things they would uh, use the the terms to denigrate her, and she has been perhaps one of the most skillful players in Europe. You know, helming uh, a country like Germany, mm -hmm. but doing mm -hmm. it with such degree of consistency, unflinchingly. Yeah. Unflinchingly. I mean, yes. I um, and integrity also. Yes, I must say she's like uh, top notch, la, you know, top notch. And it's not easy because remember during the elections, this is about, about our time, la, uh, mm. the, Germany, the German elections took place first, but master stroke, la. <laughs> masterful. <laughs> the way she did it was quite uh, impressive. Mm. And of course, you know, Jacinda Ardern and people say, what I like about New Zealand is because they're mainstreaming women's empowerment. They're mainstreaming the whole governance structure. is centered on pro providing a safe environment for children. Yeah, that's very important. So, can you imagine? That's so. That's so wonderful. I think like mothers everywhere, fathers everywhere. You know, societies everywhere feel that's such a novel and noble kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of uh, agenda, right? For us to to make. Um, and of course, uh, Dr. Miko, uh, she's also, you know, given a lot of support from Penang. <laughs> but <laughs> the point is, it's just, it's just wonderful. And we, we have to continue to celebrate them and provide uh, more pathways for other women. Now, I just want to add on, um, I think that's why in terms of policy, certain things can be done immediately. And that's why we shouldn't wait until <clears throat> we, we come up with a certain figure. But men everywhere also have to take note and do their part. Do the part. Yeah, yeah, together. Because, you, you know, you see, like, victimization happens even by women. So it, the, the issue is it happens far worse off, and you know, women are far worse off in terms of even across the, the statistical spectrum. And that, that's why we're raising this issue, right? Because systemically, we need to ensure that they are uh, protected and empowered. But by the same token, these values are gender neutral. YB, thank you for being with us today. Thank and you for uh, me. I must say, you know, it was uh, inspiring to listen to oh, your no. thoughts. And uh, I think I am seeing a future 
women prime minister in you. Yeah, okay. that's okay. paper. Good prime minister, prime minister. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whoever okay. that may be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> probably my children will be there to celebrate, right? Uh, but yeah. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Know? you. And Thank keep, you. Uh, you know, keep uh, doing whatever that you are doing, and uh, the nation will support you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, uh, that was a young, vibrant and cheerful YB and I hope you have uh, gained some good insights. Um, as I said now, we have close to about 430 participants who have joined us this afternoon. And for those of you who have just joined, especially the women, happy Women's Day. Now, before we move on to the, our next panel speakers, we will do a quick poll and I invite you to participate. I invite you to participate as well as to answer just four questions, and then we'll come back and look at the results later. Can we have the poll now? The first question is: uh, How effective is your organization's diversity, equity, and inclusive policy? Effective, moderate, etc. The second one is. Uh, how do you, do you feel that your management is doing enough to advocate D, E, and I at your workplace? And then this is the third question. And the fourth one. If we can do this, then uh, if you're getting about almost 70%, then we will close the poll. Okay, thank you very much and we will come back later and look at the results. Now we move on to the second part and please allow me to introduce our speaker who is none other than Ms. Lee Su Fen, partner and Malaysia talent leader, Ernst and Young Consulting and EY ASEAN Diversity, Equity and Inclusiveness leader. Ms. Sufan began her career as an auditor and her professional accounting career spent 10 years, including a five-year term with EY in Singapore. Passionate about creating an exceptional experience for EY people and a strong advocate of inclusive leadership, belonging and well-being, Sufan's unique experience, having been in both service line and talent functions, put her in a good state to accelerate the DENI agenda in EY. Sufan is also the global partner for EY's Ripples in Malaysia, which is EY's global corporate responsibility program that provides opportunities for EY people to positively impact the lives of individuals in our community, communities using skills, knowledge, and experience. Her topic today is reshaping leadership, getting serious about DENI diversity, equality, and inclusivity. Sufan, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Siva. Thank you, MIM, as well, uh, for giving me the stage uh, this afternoon. And happy International Women's Day to everybody celebrating. I have 20 minutes, uh, and it is such a difficult thing to do uh, after YB speaks, and I, I really enjoyed her session. Now, while she came from a policy making at the governmental, at the, 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 the country perspective, what I'm going to spend time on this afternoon is really to talk a little bit more about what I know best um, in a corporate environment, policy setting, and how do we take DE&I 
seriously, which is uh, keeping in, 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 in line with the topic that we have this afternoon. Um, I have a colleague with me uh, in the room. Uh, she's Valerie Vincent Thomas. She's part of my ASEAN DE and I team. She is helping me with the slides this afternoon. So thank you, thank you, Valerie, and also thank you to Katie, uh, who is uh, from our BMC team helping us this afternoon as well. Um, in the 20 minutes, I will be spending time on three topics, Val. Uh, let's focus on the topic for this afternoon. Uh, because it's 20 minutes, I do want to make the time worthwhile for everybody in the room. Um, I know we've got more than 400 uh, people now. Um, so I will spend a very uh, a quick few minutes on what is DE and I. Um, in, in EY, we talk about DE and I and not DEI because uh, DEI in, in some uh, pockets of the world, uh, that could be uh, known as a Latin word for God. So, you know, it's DE and I in, 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 in EY. Uh, very quickly, inclusive leadership at EY, uh, we are very serious about uh, inclusive leadership and I will tell you why uh, and how we are doing it. And the last part, I will also tell you, it's, um, it's not just about say, it's also about do. Uh, in a corporate environment, one of the key things is how to constantly close the say-do gap. So what we say, we do. So I will give you some examples uh, on what we are doing currently in the firm. So what is DE&I very quickly? And, and this is really at the highest level. Uh, obviously, on this topic, right, we could spend one whole day and even beyond in understanding uh, uh, the subject matter. But within the time, diversity is really about all the differences that we see around us. Equity is a little bit different from equality. Equity really means different needs and circumstances of the people are considered. Uh, in our decision-making, in what we do in the organization. And inclusiveness is key. Inclusiveness is about um, not undermining the differences. In fact, we embrace differences. It's about leveraging um, all the differences that you see uh, around you in the organization, in EY's uh, perspective, to help us achieve better outcome. In, in, you know, in a sense, we are in business. We talk about achieving better business results. And of course, when you achieve better results, uh, many downstream things, uh, good things can happen to our people. Uh, better career uh, opportunities, uh, career advancements, better reward structure, etc. So DE&I at this point in time is not fluffy. It definitely uh, is a very, uh, 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 what do you call that, embedded part of uh, the business. So when we talk about differences, of course, uh, today's topic is about gender. A lot of it is about gender because it's 8th of March. But in actual fact, in EY, we celebrate all differences. And you can see on the screen here, some differences are very visible. We can see education background, where you are working, your location, your country of origin, um, and, and maybe a little bit about the language that you speak. But differences are also what you can't see and is really below the surface. They are invisible. Uh, things like thinking on communication style, about leadership style, and really ethnicity these days are not so clear cut as well. And of course, there are the sexual orientations which are beneath the surface, uh, diverse uh, abilities. And we talk about, you know, sometimes disabilities only on aspects that you can see. For example, people who can't see very well, who can't hear very well, or who can't walk very well. But in truth, uh, different abilities also um, impact the way we think. For example, neurodiversity, which is also another big topic that in EY we are looking at the spectrum of, say, for example, um, uh, the different way we think, the ADHD uh, is one. Uh, that we are looking at how to integrate them more uh, to EY's workforce as well. So as you can see, all differences matter. So the key thing is not so much about the differences that you can see in the real world around us. Uh, the important thing is to how do you then gel all the differences that you see around you in a way that will be beneficial to the way we work in an environment. So this slide here is really just uh, a lead into my next section, basically telling us that we want diversity in our teams. But the important thing is not so much about diversity because homogeneous teams, some might argue in the room, right? what's wrong with people who look like me and sound like me? And if you are in leadership, uh, if you are team leaders of some sort in the room, you might have caught yourself many times in the past saying that, you know, you know, this person is really good in my team. 
before I say anything or I write anything or I do anything, she seems to understand what I want to say next. Really, really good. She understands me. Now, while that is uh, something to be celebrated in some occasions, sometimes that might not be. Because, you know, that would mean that there will only be a need for one of you and not two of you. Because if two people think alike and do the same things, why do we need two of us in the room? There cannot be better creativity or innovation if all of us think alike uh, and do alike and expect the same outcome. So here, uh, the three graphs here, all you need to know is that while homogeneous teams which are well managed uh, have a place uh, in the corporate environment depending on the circumstances, diverse teams are beneficial and good for the ultimate outcome if if they are well managed. You see on the bottom curve here, uh, diverse teams, people who are very, very different from one another, if they are not well managed, and the question is what is well managed here, right? Um, it does not deliver the outcome that we want. So the key thing for us to think about today as we talk about getting serious about uh, being inclusive in the way we lead is how do we then engage the entire workforce who are very different uh, to achieve the ultimate outcome? So. Let me start by, you know, the second part of my sharing, it's about how do we get serious about uh, uh, inclusive leadership? So this slide here, some of us here might have heard this uh, saying before, culture is strategy for breakfast. Now, EY didn't come up with this. Uh, Sufan definitely did not come up with this. In fact, this is a very famous saying by a management guru called Peter Drucker, uh, which you can look up very instantly on the internet. He famously said that, you know, you can have the best piece of strategy in place, uh, the best intention and all. You could have spent all your money brainstorming and such. But if you have, don't have the right culture to carry the strategy, it would probably be doomed to fail right from the start. Now, uh, for some of us who maybe don't quite, you know, get this piece, you know, why culture is so important to making sure that the strategy that we have in place definitely could see, you know, the living daylight and you actually could see the outcome that you want. A very simple example. Uh, all of us or many of us actually are, are drivers here on the roads. So uh, there are many different types of drivers, good drivers, uh, uh, amateur drivers, not so good drivers, reckless drivers and such. But we have a very good, by and large, good road systems. We've got traffic lights, uh, we've got road signs, we've got roads which are fairly well built. Now, uh, if you imagine that the roads and the systems and such are your culture, are your culture here, and your strategy, the people who are going to make things happen uh, are the drivers. You can have the best road system and the, uh, 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 the, the roads itself, but if you have reckless drivers who will overtake uh, without looking at your traffic lights and such, you might still end up with uh, loads of uh, issues or accidents on the road. So just to give you a, a standpoint of why culture is so important uh, in making sure that what you say you want to achieve for your firm, for your company, for your people, uh, is really the underlying factor that you need to focus on. So what does that mean then? Um, let me speak from the EY's perspective. So let me focus on a few slides upcoming, uh, looking at how serious we are in making sure that we have a right culture uh, in the way we team and lead. Not just lead, but also how we team. Uh, in the company, just like many of you here, none of us uh, you know, is an island. Uh, we definitely need to work with different teams, whether in tech teams or cross-departmental teams and such. Uh, Karen is our ultimate boss uh, when it comes to our DE&I organization. And to show that how serious we are about making sure that DE&I is part of our business, EY's business is huge, uh, we have a whole DE&I team and organization. And they are not just part of the talent and you know they are in the back room or in the middle office and such. Uh, Karen is a global vice chair. She is actually at the table, right at the top of the leadership uh, with our CEO, global CEO, uh, global COO and such in making decisions that would impact the 150 countries that we operate in, uh, the 250,000 people that we have. So DE&I is serious in EY. We have people who focus uh, full time on this and they are at the table when it comes to decision making and when it comes to strategy uh, 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 device as such. The second thing to show that we are serious about DEI in uh, EY is that we actually have a very uh, structured way of approaching DEI, i.e., our roadmap. 
by virtue of it being called a roadmap, uh, you will understand that we are nowhere near where we want to be. EY is nowhere near. Uh, just like everybody, I think by and large in Malaysia, uh, in fact, to many companies and many quarters in the society, that word could be a very alien word. What is diversity, we understand. And we, many of us think that by virtue of us being born in Malaysia, uh, we are by nature very inclusive. Uh, but that is probably furthest from the truth. We understand diversity, but we may not be very good in making sure that we include diversity in the way we live and work. So EY has a roadmap. And if you look at the roadmap, we recognize the diversity which matter to us, but we also recognize that we need two hands to clap. We need the firm, the organization to take uh, actions. We call that putting in equity guardrail, right? We need to raise awareness. We need to make sure that changes need to happen. What are the policies? What are the processes? Uh, what are the guidelines? What are the non-negotiables? What are the infrastructure that we need to put in place to enable culture change? So that is on the part of the organization. And I am that part of the organization that helps to make the change uh, as is well in my team. And on the other hand, and most importantly though, it's the people. In Malaysia, EY, we've got close to 4,000 people. Uh, around the world, 300,000 by and large. Each one of us cannot depend on the company or on the firm uh, to make the change that we need to see, ultimately in driving highest performing teams. We are expecting all our individuals, we're influencing them, in fact, myself included, uh, to understand what it means uh, to be leading and teaming more inclusively from understanding that we are all different in our perspectives and we are biased. If you are human, you are biased, let's be real. So if we are biased, then how do we make sure that we value the differences and understand that people have different perspectives from us? Um, looking at how do we identify and break the insider and outsider dynamics and focus a little bit more on in-in dynamics and understand and practice and model role modeling, inclusive uh, behavior and teaming and leading inclusively. And finally, we are expecting everybody, not just the bosses at the top, to be really the, what we call the culture influencer. The culture influencer. Um, how we do things, what we say around the ground, around the ground in the office every day, influences the culture. So if you only depend on your heads of departments or your bosses or your CEOs or your C-suites to do what they need to do, um, the change of culture is going to be harder. Might not be impossible, but it would take a lot more effort and energy. The best thing to do is to make sure that we are all on the journey together. So roadmap is another one. Be clear about where we want to head and what is it that we need to do. What is the third thing that we do other than infrastructure, organization, and the roadmap? The third thing that we look at is, fine, you are telling me that you know uh, inclusive leadership is the right thing to do and we should be serious about it. But actually, on a day-to-day -day basis, when I lead teams, when I work in the teams, when I work with my clients, um, what does that mean to be teaming and leading inclusively? How do these behaviors look like in real life? And how can I practice them? So inclusive behaviors basically can be bucketed into three buckets, uh, as you can see on the screen here, and there are six very specific behaviors. Uh, firstly, I spoke about understanding our own preferences and biases, but more importantly is to include and understand and seek out different perspectives so that we can be more creative and innovative and better solutioning for our people and our clients. The second bucket is really about making sure that everybody has a chance to contribute. And the third or fourth one is, I'm okay, I will flex my style. I'm not asking people to change, we're not asking that. We're just asking about you know situations that are different, may require different ways to lead and get to the outcome. So we should be able to flex to get there. And the last bucket is really about, uh, you know, I'm okay to defer my decision making. Why do I, as a team leader, need to make all the decisions? Can I empower more? And can I make sure that everybody who does not look like me and sound like me can be successful in the organization or in the teams? So uh, you can see a whole bunch of critical enablers there. So this is really the crux in EY, right? When we talk about teaming and leading inclusively, uh, we are doing a lot of work around this, as you see later on when we talk about putting things into action, bringing DNI or DENI or inclusive leadership to life. What are we doing? And uh, the 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 chart on the right hand side, uh, you will see that in a little bit coming up. So uh, I think this is the third third thing. The third thing. The fourth thing uh, to show that we are getting serious about uh, inclusive leadership. It's about putting it square, front and center, 
in our value statement. So if you can see on the screen here, this is EY's next wave strategy, uh, very clearly spells out our ambition. Uh, what will support our amb ambition would be our strategic pillars. But more importantly, right, it's about the underpinning values that we expect everybody who comes and join the firm to appreciate, to uphold, and making sure that we upstand when they don't think uh, uh, things not uh, go according to what we think that people should be doing. Because Neuro, YB Neuro spoke about um, the moral compass. We also spoke about uh, our value statement and our purpose, the building a better working world, being our North Star uh, in guiding our actions and inactions. When we don't do something, it's because our values say that we should not. So inclusiveness is squarely uh, in our value statement. And everybody gets to see this on the day one that they join uh, on onboarding. Uh, the fifth thing, that we show that we are serious. So yeah, you are, you are getting the drift, right? We are trying to close the say-do gap. If we say it's important enough, right? What is the firm doing about it? What do we expect of our people? Is to put it into the ecosystem and making sure that whether you turn left or right, right, you'll be able to see leading inclusively. Diversity is important. We need to be equitable. You know, all those things you will see uh, in the firm. So leading by the code, this is called our global code of conduct. The code of conduct is basically not so much like an SOP, but really is our um, guiding principles uh, in how we should work with one another, how do we work with clients, acting with integrity, how do we protect intellectual property, for example. So one of the codes is really to make sure that have I thought about, am I treating others the way I expect others to treat me? And in working with one another, you can see that on the screen here, we specifically spells out that multiculturalism and multicultural experience and diversity is a strength uh, as opposed to a weakness. And if it's a strength, how do we uphold this? So we respect one another. We make sure that the environment is an inclusive one for everybody to be able to thrive and to succeed. And uh, this thing about discrimination, intimidation, and harassment happens everywhere. The question is, if we see something not right, uh, firstly, we don't do that. We don't be the naughty people. But if you don't see things right, what are some of the things that you can do? So the code actually put, uh, you know, uh, gives certain guidance on what is it that you can do to upstand and to speak up as well, when things don't work well. The sixth thing, it's about our leadership model. Now, what we call this is an inside-out leadership model. It's called transformative leadership model. Everybody from the youngest person who joins us from day one from university to our leadership partners like myself, uh, we need to be able to understand this firstly. And second thing, to make sure that we are assessed, we understand we are being assessed, and we also look at how we assess and evaluate one another in the organization. Um, so... If you look at the gray ring, we call that the uh, inner ring. The center ring is about me. Um, uh, Siva and YB spoke about loving ourselves earlier, better me. And we say that a lot, right? Well-being starts with you. If you cannot look after yourself, you cannot look after your team, uh, plain and clear. And well-being, in fact, uh, is a leadership competency in EY. It's not something fluffy. It is a leadership competency. How do you look after yourself? And how do you look after one another? So the transformative leadership model, again, squarely and plainly put leading inclusively in the way we expect our people to behave. The gray ring that you see, better us, it's all about teaming and leading inclusively, that you inspire by leading inclusively. You make sure you promote a culture of belonging so that everybody can succeed and thrive. And you also promote the highest performing teaming by teaming and leading inclusively. So everybody sees this again from day one. And every year when it comes to assessment and evaluation, uh, this model is upheld. And we look at how people do things, not just about dollars and cents. When it's about business, right, it's all about dollars and cents, of course. But it is also about everything else. The people who are going to be delivering the value in driving at financial value, which is going to see in the next slide. Uh, Val, yeah. So here, I think I, I lost count now. Is it six or seven? Uh, the way we are very serious about uh, weaving DNI or DNI in the way we operate is about the way we measure ourselves. And many of us have seen this, right? What gets measured gets done. So earlier on in the slide, uh, two slides away uh, earlier, you saw that our ambition is such on the left-hand side. If that's our ambition, and we have a strategy, how are we going to get there? So if you look at this on the screen here, 
the measures uh, that we are measuring ourselves in order to get to our our uh, uh, where we want to be heading uh, by the time FY25 comes around, um, one big part it's on DNI, cutting across client values, people value, social value, and financial value. If it's running a business, it's all about money. Really, EY should just be focusing on financial value, growing the revenue, uh, growing the income for the partners, or if it's just about serving clients, it would just be you know meeting client expectations providing a positive experience and making sure that we team across account teams well. But you know what? It's not like that. DEI impacts across um, the people whom we serve, the clients whom we serve, the people that we have, the wider community and also financials. So we are measured on what we call a DNI tracker. All the markets, the regions, um, teams in the world, we are measured annually by something called a DNI tracker. And the DNI tracker measures two things. One is the balance and mix, which talks about the diversity, right? Is your leadership diverse enough? Not just in education background, but maybe, you know, uh, have they uh, uh, worked for a stint outside of Malaysia so that the horizon is a bit broader? Um, are they all homegrown? Uh, are they also directly admitted partners? So do we have enough diversity so that we can have better creativity in the way we lead? And the second index is really about inclusiveness. And that one there is not about what we can control. It's about uh, the feedback from our people in the people power surveys that we run four times in a year. Uh, EY no longer runs an annual survey. Our power survey is pulse, right? So it's very timely and uh, in the short term, every quarter, uh, we would have uh, touch points on how we are doing around things which are important to us. The next about getting serious, other than being measured, it's about putting a DNI strategy in the way we operate. So um, Val and I are very familiar with this. Uh, this is our DNI strategy in ASEAN. Uh, we have priorities, of course, uh, and enablers um, supporting each of the strategies. Uh, every day that we do work on, uh, we must uh, make sure that we we track along the strategy and we want to get to where we want to get to. There are goals that we set. Uh, some are a bit more strategic, so it takes a bit longer, but some are a bit more programmatic. For example, celebrating IWD. It's an initiative, it's a program, it's a bit short term, uh, but most of the things are probably a bit medium term and long term, which itself, uh, later on in during the Q&A, there is a question I remember uh, on what is the most difficult thing. I will talk a little bit about why is it difficult sometimes uh, to see through or even have a DEI strategy. More to come. So if all these things are important and we are serious, that's why you can see that from values to code of conduct, to the way we measure our people, to the way we measure our business, um, to so many things that we do, to having a concrete DEI strategy and roadmap. What are we actually doing that our people are seeing? How do we bring DE&I to life then on a day-to-day -day basis? So I, I'm not able to, to you know, spend a lot more time. So what we've done, uh, well and I have done, is really to put something very quickly on the screen here that you can see. So inclusive leadership, it's a big thing for us. We can talk about a lot of things about celebrating IWD. We can talk about celebrating cultural diversity in May. Um, but if you're not going to have the right tone from the top, uh, the role models that you want to see, the behaviors that we should be having, things are not going to happen on the ground, right? So tone from the top. And because of that, in ASEAN, uh, inclusive leadership uh, high-touch sessions uh, we run, it's a compulsory session for all our partners and leaders to attend. And, you know, we've got seven or 800 leaders in ASEAN, and I'm very happy that the attendance rate has been um, I would say better than expected. And for those who can't attend physical classes, there is recording for them to go through, but it's compulsory so that they know uh, 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 and aware of what they need to do. Uh, there is a SharePoint site that has all the materials ready for people to uh, um, uh, get better educated and get toolkits and all that that may help them in doing their work. We have campaigns. We always have campaigns. We have well-being campaigns. And we also have this very important commitment to an inclusive work culture campaign that tells people simple things like, for example, all of us have just slowly emerged right, from the lockdown and we are able to, to be maybe a bit more free in the way we want to um, attend office, attend to your client space and such. We are asking people, um, you know, as part of uh, uh, upholding uh, 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 inclusive work culture, for example, a very simple one, I think all of us, you'll be nodding your head when I say this. 
can we not hold meetings during lunchtime? Can we not hold meeting at six o'clock? Can we not have back-to-back -back Zoom calls? Uh, can we not agree on what is the call hours? Can we have a Friday afternoon to really clear our work? That is really, you know, without you saying more, that is really part of what we can all do if you are team leaders. And that is really part of a, a commitment to an inclusive culture as well. Because other than work responsibilities, all of us as individuals, we've got personal responsibilities as well. If you hold a meeting during lunch, what it means is you may be depriving someone from, say, um, having a proper lunch first and for all, uh, for that person's sanity or time out or catching up with email or even feeding the young child. Or if you hold a meeting at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, what you are doing basically may be um, excluding, say, mothers who need to cook, uh, who can't really attend the meetings. And if she's going to attend the meeting, she's going to get into a situation of dinners are not going to be on the table for the family and then we may have issues uh, in the family later on. So without you know, really understanding the big theory and principles and such, there are so many little small things that all of us can do to make lives of each other better. Um, we also run onboarding. Uh, the people who join us, first thing that we do is to make sure that, um, if you don't mind, Belle, if you can go back, I just want to highlight one more thing that will lead on to our sessions later on, uh, which is this, what we call the DNI Champions Network. Um, you know, we need to have as many influences as possible on the ground. And many of these influences are not women. They're not women because inclusion, right, or inclusiveness, the behaviors of being inclusive really is gender blind. Um, it's really everybody. So many of our DNI champions who are embedded in the business uh, to help us change culture, they are men. They are men. They put up their hands and they want to make a difference. And uh, I think that's an important observation that I want to share as well because gender inclusion um, it's not just about women speaking up for women. It's also about um, men being allies and advocates uh, to everyone, not just women as well. Yep. Uh, the last thing, I think, last a few slides on how we put things into action, bringing it to life, is to make um, build awareness and capability on the ground. The 4,000 people that we have, how do we raise awareness and making sure they've got better capability uh, in understanding how to behave inclusively is to make certain um, e-learning, web-based learning compulsory. Uh, inclusive leadership for all, very simple, two and a half hours. Workplace behavior about what is not right when it comes to bullying, when it comes to sexual harassment, when it comes to discrimination. What does that mean and what is it that you can do? What are the channels to raise alarm or, or raise feedback? And all those things that you can see uh, on the right-hand side that we are doing, that people can take it upon themselves to do at their own time. What else? Now, EY is so focused that we even have a global platform in bringing uh, gender uh, uh, inclusion uh, and gender parity into the fore, right? So Women Fast Forward, anyone, if you Google now, uh, you would see Women Fast Forward is uh, accessible to public as well. Uh, it's EY's global platform uh, that engages not just our internal people, but also to our clients and our community to advance uh, hopefully moving away from equality into equity as well. And we are very much focused on three distinct areas, uh, will, women in leadership. And uh, you will see on the next slide, I just want to share with you a little bit more on women in technology and also uh, women entrepreneurship as well. My last slide is to focus on this, what we call women in tech movement in bringing it really real. Um, I think the COVID lockdown and the digital transformation that we need uh, when we emerge from the COVID lockdown to be stronger and building resilient enterprises, uh, really bring this thing called um, the STEM, uh, the focus on STEM uh, a lot more um, uh, uh, since then. And what we notice is that um, with the digital transformation uh, leading the way, we also notice that as an organization, uh, there is an obvious lacking in women talent coming through in uh, the workplace, uh, never mind about leadership, just on uh, workforce alone, uh, technology is probably not something that women choose naturally in uh, uh, education when they go to tertiary education. So what we are seeing is as a lack of participation. So the firm is focused a lot on uh, women in tech in doing a lot more, uh, not just within the firm, but also collaborating with the markets as well, hopefully to change this uh, imbalance uh, uh, more uh, moving for ahead. Uh, if you're going to succeed in building resilient enterprises, 
in making sure that digital transformation um, is successful, not just for EY, but for the uh, business landscape as a whole, this has to be a focus. I think with that, um, Siva, uh, I am good. Uh, I look forward to taking questions right at the end. Thank you, Ms. Sufan, for sharing the EY model on DE and I, and the good work done by EY, not only in Malaysia, but globally. Now let's move on to the uh, third speaker for the day. And uh, our distinguished speaker is none other than Dr. Shanti Tambaya, Associate Professor, Gender Studies, Faculty of Arts and Social Science, University of Malaya. Dr. Shanti's research interests are situated in the fields of social anthropology, social anthropology and uh, gender studies with a particular interest in understanding culture change and changing gender relations. Her current research interests are in the areas of gender migration and gender identity, gender and work, families in flux and violence, gender and public policies. Her work has been published in leading peer-reviewed journals such as Gender, Place and Culture, the Asian Pacific Journal of uh, Anthropology, Children's Geography, Asian Journal of Women's Studies, and others. Dr. Shanti is a recipient of various awards and fellowships, including the Asian Public Intellectual Award at the University of Kyoto, Senior Fellowship at the Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore, and the Fulbright Fellowship at the University of California, Berkeley. And her topic today is DENI in Malaysia. How far have we progressed? Dr. Shanti. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Siva. Um, the topic given to me is on DENI in Malaysia. How far have we progressed? So basically what I need to do in this presentation in this short 20 minutes is to actually show you uh, how Malaysia is faring in terms of uh, gender equality because today is International Women's Day. I will be predominantly focused on uh, the ENI in, from a gender perspective, which is focused on women. So in terms of uh, how Malaysia fares, uh, in terms of gender equality, um, we need to use indicators and indexes. Uh, one indicator that we have comes to us from the World Economic Forum. It's the Global Gender Gap Report measures, uh, and the measures have uh, show how nations have progressed towards gender parity by examining the gender gap across 153 countries, and Malaysia ranked 112 out of 153 nations in the Global Gender Gap Index in 2021. That's very um, uh, disappointing that we are ranked 112 out of 153 countries. Um, and um, in 2020, we were ranked 104, which means we are sliding down, uh, which is not uh, very positive, but it's very regressive. So um, we have to address this, it's very bad. The report focuses on gender equality by considering four variables, and the four variables are economic participation and opportunity, educational attainment, health and survival, and political empowerment. Progress in educational attainment, uh, we are close to parity. Health and survival also, we are doing quite well, close to parity. Nevertheless, the ranking and parity scores for political empowerment and economic participation and opportunity fall outside the favorable range. So these are two areas that we have to work on, political empowerment and in terms of economic participation and opportunity. So Malaysia is behind all its neighbors in ASEAN, uh, except for Myanmar in terms of our uh, gender parity score. So this is also a worrying trend. Therefore, we need to proceed with urgency to address this critical issue for economic and political equality between the genders. 
So this is something that we have to be very concerned about and we have to work on. Although much has been achieved in terms of amending legislation that discriminates women, but there is no precise definition of discrimination in our legal system. So no, no laws and no acts and no bills in this country has defined discrimination. So uh, if we want to look at diversity, equity and inclusiveness, uh, it's very fundamental for us to describe the process that is going to deny that diversity, equity, and inclusiveness, which is discrimination. So we need to define it in our legal system. The Ministry of Women, Family, and Community Development, with the support of activists, feminist activists, and activists from the women's movement and academics, drafted an Anti-Discrimination Against Women Act, but this act has been put on hold as the ministries focus on tabling the Sexual Harassment Act in Parliament. This draft bill has defined discrimination and this will be instrumental in addressing the diversity, equity and inclusion concern of the nation. So fundamentally, we have to define discrimination if we want to address this whole concept of diversity, equity and inclusion. If we do not uh, define what discrimination is. So the entire exercise is um, not going to lead us anywhere. So we need to uh, address this urgently. And uh, we have already put in process the work needed to define the term in the Anti-Discrimination Against Women Act, which is a draft act, which needs to be worked on further. So this Acts, norms, and policies are very important. Why are they important? Because they will create a positive gender sensitive culture. People will know there are laws against discriminating uh, uh, based on uh, gender, uh, based on race, based on class, based on. It's there in the Constitution, but the Constitution also doesn't define discrimination. So, we need to have a positive gender sensitive culture and we also need to encourage males and females to engage in activities geared towards gender equality. And if we have this in place, we may see many prejudices experienced by women eliminated. Significant problems remain because of structural, cultural and institutional roadblocks. Substantial public policy efforts is required together with enthusiastic leadership in promoting gender inclusive practices, which means we need leadership irrespective of it being male or female to accept the fact that there are um, inequality in society and we need to address these inequalities. So we have to have gender inclusive practices in place and leadership needs to embrace and promote gender inclusive practices. So the gender norms expect, so what, what contributes to a culture that is that leads to inequality? Our gender norms, our, our belief systems. Uh, gender norms expect men to provide for their family financially, and um, they perceive themselves as natural leaders. So what has happened is that the whole notion of the male breadwinner uh, is one of the reasons for why we are falling back in terms of our ranking uh, on um, economic uh, participation and opportunity, because we still are holding on to the notion of the male breadwinner and that men have to provide for the family. And that perceive that also leads to eventually to the notion that men are natural leaders. So um, there's a very interesting study done by Elaine and Kurabis uh, in, in Malaysia uh, to establish that Malaysia has a patriarchal environment, especially one with the classic model of the breadwinner, father, housewife, mothers, uh, and how um, women have to pull, um, uh, have major responsibilities in the household. And um, the study also showed that in urban areas, although women are working, 
they still have to maintain their reproductive roles, which means they have to still do the main caregiving and uh, um, work. While in rural areas, women hold both productive and reproductive roles within their family. So in this particular study, respondents associated patriarchal values in Malaysian families with three factors. One is the society's norms. Second is the religion. Third is the tradition and culture. And how is this, how are these norms transmitted? And these norms are transmitted through socialization. So we have to work with the way in which we socialize the next generation to abandon this kind of practices. So the, the existing gender equality practices are far um, from enough and should be addressed um, consistently throughout Malaysia's organization. So we, we have to accept the fact that um, there are discrimination and we have to address uh, this discrimination um, uh, to uh, be able to put in place this whole idea, this whole concept of diversity, equity, and inclus inclusiveness. So the existing gender equality practices are far from enough and should be addressed consistently throughout Malaysia's organizations. The Malaysian government is should be encouraged to make significant efforts to increase the involvement of women in all aspects of decision-making in both the workplace and in other areas such as politics. Encouraging women and as inspiring them to succeed on a deeper level in their professional and personal lives is undoubtedly a priority. Having a voice elevates the status of women in society and with increased prominence, they rise to greater heights in their many endeavors. It appears that empowering women can help break down gender inequality and that they must utilize their personal, relational and environmental forms of emp empowerment to bring about gender equality. So, Let's look at the two areas that I was asked to focus on, uh, women entrepreneurs uh, and leaders, leadership. So the involvement of women in entrepreneurship has increased. Uh, women make up about 20% of all registered entrepreneurs. Uh, it's very low, <laughs> one in five are female. Um, and, um, Certainly, uh, the numbers have escalated, uh, but um, as the consequence of the turbulently shifting society in Houston, entrepreneurial interests, we see um, that the situation is quite in, uh, in flux at the particular moment. Uh, the, num the number of women participating in entrepreneurial uh, activities has expanded. And if we look at those who have dropped out from the labor force, who have lost their job, uh, due to companies downsizing and, uh, you know, closure, uh, we will see a lot of them entering into, you know, uh, entrepreneurial activities, but in an informal uh, manner as, um, as a means of livelihood. So um, even though the topic of women's entrepreneurship has been getting a lot of attention, the definition of women entrepreneurship is complex because different schools of thought classify it in different ways, thus making it problematic to agree on a rationalization of women entrepreneurship. According to the emerging literature on this subject matter, a woman entrepreneur is the owner or the head, owner manager, or in other words, a woman head of an enterprise who can create new jobs and develop the economy. Therefore, a woman entrepreneur is a person who has founded, who has bought, or who has inherited an enterprise, either by herself or with a partner or colleague of the opposite gender, who is liable for all the risks concerned in the business, who participates in all functions, governance, control, and management of the business enterprise. As an incentive, women entrepreneurs are offered financial aid. Uh, I mean, uh, we have a lot of micro credit um, facilities in this country to encourage women to take up entrepreneurship. Uh, one such um, institution is the Amanah Ithia Malaysia and the Tabung Economy Kumpulan Usaha Nyaga, which is called Takul, to carry out uh, businesses. 
um, apart from financial aid, women entrepreneurs are also supported through product skills and other training. However, most female entrepreneurs are subsistence entrepreneurs. They earn very little for themselves after paying their monthly loan installment. So how do we move them out of being subsistence entrepreneurs? They're very good. They have enriched the organizations. They have funded them. Amanatia, when it started, and now uh, uh, to diff has grown many fold because of um, uh, you know small scale businesses that women have entered into, and they are very good paymasters. And because they are paying up their loan, Amanatia and most uh, microcredit financing organization have benefited from women uh, working towards paying up their loan. But at the end of the day, have these women, uh, you know, benefited? Most of them are, are good paymasters, they pay up, but then in terms of their earning, their earnings are not much, so they can't grow. Uh, so there's a lot of research that's pointing out that we have to actually move women out of this subsistence stage of entrepreneurial activity into a much more transformational kind of entrepreneurial activity where they can play an important role in um, uh, creating jobs and employing other women to uh, be part of their enterprise. So these are some of the things that we need to look into, but um, we don't know with the pandemic, how many of these small scale businesses have closed down, especially during the movement control order. Um, now let's look at um, leadership. Uh, a, a study by Ipsos uh, revealed that the top issues faced by women uh, in Malaysia are misperceptions of women's empowerment. It's very strange that Malaysia tends to overestimate the number of female politicians in the country. But in majority of the countries around the world, people actually underestimate the numbers. So this is a, a, a Ipsos study. Uh, uh, it's, it's also very <laughs> strange that in Malaysia, they tend to think that there are plenty of uh, female politicians, but the reality is there are very, very few, and we are doing very badly in terms of um, uh, our scores in, in political empowerment. So uh, we have to address this. But it, a, a study that was done on uh, how Malaysians perceive women's uh, participation in politics and leadership, uh, Malaysians seem to think that they overestimate the number of female politicians in the country. And, uh, and in contrast to other countries around the world, uh, that underestimates. Uh, even so, the majority view around the world is that women need to be better represented. Um, and uh, six in 10 people globally agree that things would work better if more women have positions uh, with responsibilities in government and companies. In Malaysia, 55% agree with this too. So this is an option held more by Malaysian women than Malaysian men. So uh, this is the, the context that we are looking at in terms of underrepresentation of women in uh, political participation and political empowerment. So what are the biggest challenges uh, that women face uh, in, security, in securing leadership roles? One is a legacy issue, uh, you know, the view that women are homemakers, women have to take responsibility to care for children, and these days, many women are still expected to take on the same role at home, despite the huge progress we have made in having more females in the workforce. The burden of having a job while still juggling the responsibilities of caregiving and housekeeping puts a lot of pressure on uh, women. This is a legacy issue. We need to overcome this legacy and we need to have more sharing and more joint and team uh, work in, in the home front. Um, the second one is gender bias. We have to accept the fact that there are gender biases in the country. Senior executives often have the boys clubs where they gather for lunches or for golf. Sometimes business related uh, discussions take place during the social activities. Unfortunately, this form of networking usually excludes women. 
Some executives have also reportedly refused to shift a meeting to accommodate the schedule of a working mum who may have to take time off to pick up her kids from school. As a result, women may still find themselves not getting sufficient face time with their colleagues or lacking the respect from their counterparts. This culture of exclusion would also discourage women from pursuing powerful positions in the organization or in politics. Okay, now I have to move on uh, to look at ways to improve diversity and inclusion in society post-pandemic. We are never going to be in a post-pandemic situation. We are going to be in endemic situation. As COVID-19 continues to affect lives and livelihoods around the world, we can already see that the pandemic and its economic fall fallout are having a regressive effect on gender equality. Women are more vulnerable to COVID-19 related economic effects. We are more vulnerable to the economic effects because of existing gender inequalities. So now coming back to the uh, diversity in equity and inclusion uh, uh, state of the country. Uh, what I am very concerned about is that inclusion has become a buzzword in business rhetoric. Organizations are striving to create inclusion to ensure equitable employment practices for marginalized groups, especially women. And with a growing number of inclusivity awards and honors, organizations also capitalize on their inclusion initi initiatives and successes to promote themselves as inclusive employers. There is an entire industry of consultants and firms that assist companies with this process. Inclusion is framed as a force for good that changes the exclusionary practices that have dominated organizations. The term inclusion seems to have augmented the term diversity, resulting in the emergence of diversity and inclusion as a standing term with other terms such as equality currently less frequently used. In the post-pandemic context, diversity and inclusion should be treated as analytically distinct. And we need to question how far the inclusion turn is changing practices in organizations. So how do organizations actually do inclusion? on which terms do they include women and minority groups? In pursuing these questions, we need to map the contours of the emerging area of crit critical inclusion studies. We're not just asking companies and organizations to have diversity for diversity's sake. We also want to address the societal inequality that exists. That's the word equity needs to be paid attention to. That's the reason why we want to include women and minority groups. But somehow in the entire exercise of DE&I, -E we don't see how that is going to address the kinds of marginalizations um, that exist in society addressed. So in pursuing these questions, we need to map the contours of the emerging areas of critical inclusion studies. That whole field of studies has emerged and to generate and develop further debates on critically theorizing the concept. Uh, and the concept, we need to uh, critically uh, also question the rhetorics around this um, term inclusion and the practices of inclusion in contemporary organizations, how inclusion manifests in different contexts, how it works for different social groups, how it continues to be implicated and interwoven with the logic of inclusion and inequality. Given the increase of women in the labor force over the last decades, we need to explore to what extent women are actually included in contemporary workplaces. We need to scrutinize the extent and quality of gender inclusion in organizations through a critical lens, allowing for the teasing out of more nuanced experiences of women and pinpoint new gendered inequalities. Contemplating on the ways in which women from minority groups fare in the process of inclusion is paramount. Against this background, we need to employ an intersectional analysis and critically scrutinize inclusion, both its rhetorics and its practice. This is important, how inclusion is approached and experienced may depend on the type of group 
or dimension of diversity involved. And therefore, fostering inclusion for different social groups involves a difference focus due to the nature of the difference between groups. It's not a question of, I have people from this country, I have people from these ethnic groups, I have people, you know, male, female, but we also need to look at, um, you know, uh, the type of group or dimension of diversity involved um, uh, due to the nature of the differences that exist between groups. If we want to address the question of equity, we need to critically scrutinize the concept of inclusion and being included. The term diversity and inclusion are often used together, yet while critical debates on diversity are well established, um, uh, the discussion of inclusion in organization um, is just emerging. So there's a lot of literature and a lot of research uh, on diversity, but the research and um, work needs, uh, that needs to be done on inclusion is just emerging. We need to think through the emergence and meaning of the categories of inclusion and probe the conceptual limits and possibilities of the term. We also need to critically explore how practices and processes of inclusion in organizations unfold and take shape in order to generate complex and nuanced understandings of how inclusion is done and the consequences that are attached to this. Previous research has extensively discussed what inclusive organizations may look, may look like and what practices impede or facilitate inclusion. We also need to uncover the politics of inclusion in organizations, who is responsible for it, how it is done, is the inclusion just a strategic game that one has to play. We need to broaden our understanding of the experience of inclusion and um, we should also not discard the continuous effort to make organizations less, less exclusionary and less unequal places to work. Rather, I would like to suggest that it is paramount to continue to explore the quality and conditions of inclusion and equality in workplaces and to reveal the blind spots. Constructive critiques of the concepts and processes of inclusion allow us to demonstrate the contemporary complexity, paradoxes, and issues that still remain with the process of inclusion in organizations. I, I think I will also like to conclude that what is very worrying is that the term diversity and inclusion are frequently used together. However, it is important to uncouple this in order to understand the different practical and theoretical work that this concept may be doing. Diversity studies has a field of inquiry has been around for a while, and the concept of diversity and approaches to diversity management have been subject to ongoing critical debates. So um, research has illustrated the curious uh, discursive transition. We have moved away from rhetoric of equal opportunities to diversity management. So why not talk about equal opportunities? We have replaced rhetorics on equal opportunities with diversity management to organizational inclusion, suggesting that these changes have been a product of evolving social ideologies and forces. Diversity rhetoric that has gradually come to replace the equal opportunities rhetoric and approaches has been critiqued for shifting diversity and equality from political anti-discrimination project to become a business case underpinned by economic arguments. With that, thank you. Sorry for taking up more time. No, not at all, Dr. Shanti. You know, thank you so much, especially the vast studies that you have undertaken over the last two decades. Now, uh, we'll move on to the uh, panel session. And before we get on to the panel session, can we take a look at the poll results? And uh, I would like to invite your you know, opinions on those results. Let's take a look at the poll results. Okay, the results are up. We have got close to about 192 persons who have participated from our participants of about 400, so it's about almost 42 percent. So the first question is, how effective is your organization's diversity, equity, and inclusion policy? Um, you can find that 
about 29%, close to 30% is effectively cis effective. Moderately effective is about 55%. Not effective is about 8%. And uh, still there is about 7% uh, policies are not in place. The second question is, uh, do you feel that your management is doing enough to advocate DE and I at your workplace? 67% um, say yes, 33% say no. Um, are this something that is very surprising? Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on this, uh, uh, Ms. Sufan? Thank you. Um, I, I can't see the screen, but I've got the WhatsApp of the results on my mobile. Um, mm -hmm. My immediate reaction for the first two questions, I'm not sure about Dr. Shanti, but I felt that it was more, it, it's more optimistic than I thought. It, mm -hmm. It's definitely a lot more optimistic uh, than I think uh, what's happening on the ground. Um, uh, you know, because it's beyond gender. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really talking about all aspects of uh, differences and how do we include on a day-to-day -day, uh, in the corporate world and also in our social life and all that in the community, right? This looks very promising. <laughs> it's very promising. Yeah, Shanti, Dr. Shanti, what do you think? I think it's because of those who have attended. I think uh, they are coming from organizations. The sample itself is biased. <laughs> I'm thinking like an academic. <laughs> Yeah. It could uh, be. So it could if be. you do a general public nationwide survey, you will see different results. This is a captured audience, and the audience is your sample, and therefore this reflects the audience position, and not Possibly, necessarily, yeah, yeah Possibly. it's not necessarily a, 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 a representation, yeah, representative sample. Of yeah. I think all the three of us. Yeah, I think all the three of us will agree, you know, and uh, on that observation. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it's a it's a good uh, result, you know, that we have positive. managed to make a positive result, you know. It is, it is. It's great that uh, kind of um, awareness. Now, we look at the, the third question. It says, uh, have you experienced any unwelcome comments or conduct at the organization that you felt very offensive, embarrassing or hurtful? 33% still say yes, 67% say no. And the fourth question is also related to that. If the answer is no, it just says that uh, it is, some say that about 46% say that it's well taken care of through policies and culture. Uh, but 8% say it's a taboo subject that is not discussed or not reported. And there is about 6% who still say they're not aware of the problem. What do you think? You expect I think, uh, I think that 33 percent we need to worry. It's one third. Mm. That means the work environment, the work ecosystem. One third is quite a large part of the, you know, the work. Yeah. Uh, community. Yeah. And one third yeah. of the community is pra practicing this kind of behavior. Yeah. It, it's it's worrying. Uh, of course, the company doesn't tolerate uh, it. They have policies they can address. So the second follow-up question, you see, that's not tolerated, and therefore they have policies and regulations and guidelines on how to address this kind of discriminatory or offensive language or behavior. Yeah. So it's yeah. quite, uh, um, I would say, uh, something that we have to be concerned about. And I, I wish we could have, uh, and I could take more questions from uh, the participants and then you know, pass it on, but uh, we've almost come towards the end of the uh, session. But I must thank both you ladies, you know, you are so passionate and you have shared so much. But let me ask you, you know, uh, Dr. Shanti, you have been uh, doing so much of work, you know, over the last uh, two decades. What inspires you? And uh, would you like to share your thoughts, you know, uh, with our audiences today? I think gender equality is extremely important. I think it's very fundamental to our the well-being of humanity and the well-being of the future of humanity. We cannot have half the population of the planet being subjected to discrimination. It is not in any way going to be beneficial, uh, you know, to anyone. So um, being inclusive 
of them and uh, eradicating discrimination will only uh, improve the world. So I am inspired because uh, I've been looking at a lot of very marginalized communities. So you can see the nature of my presentation because I work with marginalized communities, uh, minority groups like the Orang Asli or the hunter gatherers in Sarawak or plantation workers. So you can see my perspective and my position is coming from that kind of um, uh, context. So mm -hmm. having worked with these groups, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about their, their issues and their problems. Uh, but I wouldn't want to say that they are victims. They are very capable and they, they are able to survive and carry through with dignity, you know. But at the same time, I think um, sometimes this kind of resilience doesn't develop capability. You live with your minimal, uh, within the minimal um, resources you have. Of course, that is resilience, but that resilience needs to be translated into capability so that you can move up uh, the social ladder, some kind of uh, social mobility, and that would lead to a better nation, more people out from the B40, the bottom yeah. rung, move up the nation, becomes a much more uh, progressive and, uh, you know, the well-being of the, the nation and the people will be much better off. So. I, I, because I come from that kind of a background, I'm, I'm inspired to look into those kind of issues. And that's Thank the you. reason for my standpoint. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And it's certainly very inspiring, you know. And uh, please continue to keep doing the excellent work. And Ms. Sufan, you, know, you are the EY ASEAN Diversity, Equity and Inclusiveness Leader. What inspires you and uh, what do you have something to share with our audience today? So, um, Dr. Shandi speaks about the nation. So, I'll speak about the firm. The, the firm is almost like a second family uh, uh, to me. Um, and, and I think before we even get there, um, I believe if there are young women in the room uh, about the possibilities or where is it that they can reach in terms of their limits, I would say that it would be the choices that we make. I think before we start there, right, because it's linked up to why uh, I do what I do. Um, I think it's making choices. In all choices, as we know, there are the pros and cons and there are consequences. So if we're going to do the things that most inspire you, uh, your purpose and what you aspire to do, uh, there may be consequences in the sense that uh, you, you may not be able to get home to cook you may not be do a lot of things. Your housework might not be something that you get to. But I think it's something that um, everybody needs to think in the room. Purpose, aspiration, that culture and environment, right, that helps you, uh, that can be negotiated, uh, I feel. Uh, uh, you can't remarry a husband, I feel, right, but you can negotiate and say that how is it that we can be better as a unit uh, to support. Uh, so I didn't get to that question. I really wanted to get to your first question on how to, 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 to inspire more. But I think for my own aspiration is that um, DE&I is really not, not a piece of you know, research that Dr. Shanti is doing. A lot of the things that she's doing right, actually can implement and execute, be executed in a corporate environment. And we, if, when we do that well, what you can see is the business outcome is so much better. It is a business imperative. It has never been a talent strategy. So for me, uh, the, 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 the goal, the drive is really to see, you know, how much more can we go? How much more can we do better um, at, from a employee engagement, from business outcome, from the firm's branding? All those are motivations, uh, not just for me, but for the leadership team as well. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Sufan. And I think that is uh, evidence based. There's a lot of research that has been done, you know, in terms of productivity and, uh, you know, how yes. the organization can move forward, right? Yes. So, with that, yes. uh, I want to thank both you, you know, both the ladies, you know, Dr. Shanti and Ms. Sufan. Thank you so much for coming on board and sharing. And uh, 
I would like to ask the uh, participants. We have still about 354. You've still been with us. Thank you so much. You know, it's almost uh, four, 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 four ten. You know, I, I'm really honored that uh, you know you've stayed on with us. Thank you so much. And I hope uh, today's session, you would be able from today's session, you'll be able to take back some of the insights and uh, look back at uh, this topic. And I would like to request all the participants. You know, if you could spare a few minutes to give your feedback about today's session by clicking on the link in the chat box and then that will help us to continuously improve. Now, if you wish to be a sponsor or a supporting partner for our crucial conversations for this year, 2022, please do write to us at events at mim.org.my. Once again, thank you, Ms. Sufan, Dr. Shanti, and to sponsoring the MIM Crucial Conversations. Thank you and have a wonderful day and happy Women's Day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.